Crafting beer is an art as old as humanity. Through the process of fermentation, barley, water, hops, and yeast combine to pour out a final product, a perfect culmination of the ingredients that make it. Add in notes of citrus, berries, or even chocolate, and that beer can reflect the subtle notes of the personality and creative mind of its master brewer. We all have a unique purpose and the potential to achieve it because of God's direction and careful hand. Understanding the process and recognizing the importance of each step is the preparation we need to begin discovering our own gifts, uncovering the purpose of our lives, and unleashing our potential. Well, good morning and welcome to the Gathering Church. My name is John Mark Redwine. I'm the lead pastor. So good to be back with you guys today. For the last few weeks, I've been doing a lot of traveling. Uh, my family has moved from one house to another and been in transition. And so Pastor Robbie has been filling in the gaps for me. And man, I'm so grateful to him. He is such a gifted communicator and an asset to our team. And so, uh, but I'm glad to be home today. There's something about coming home, especially when my literal home is, is filled with boxes and the furniture's in the wrong places right now. It feels good to be at a home that is right this morning. Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Come on, dads, give it up for the dads in the room. Man, I'm, I'm just so glad to, to celebrate you guys today. Father's Day is, is so much easier than Mother's Day, isn't it? Because moms have this high expectation. You really got to show up for mom. You got to impress mom. You got to work hard for mom. Dad is just happy with the same pocket knife that you gave him last year that he lost at some point last month. I think every year for Father's Day growing up, I always gave my dad a pocket knife, and he was always grateful for it. You know what I mean? He was. Dads are simple. Dads like repetition. Like every time dad sees the neighbor washing his car, he can't help himself but say, hey, how about you wash mine next? Every single time. Every time a dad ties something down with straps, he's got to give it a slap one time and say, well, that's not going anywhere before he walks inside. Every time the cashier rings up something and it doesn't show a price, he goes, well, I guess that one's free then. He can't help himself. Dad's love repetition. They love cargo shorts and they love white sneakers. It's why we love dads. My daughter is starting to learn the ways. She's only four years old and she's learning not to say I'm hungry anymore because every time she accidentally says the words, I'm hungry, I always say, hi, hungry, I'm dad. Come on, you guys were supposed to finish that. You know how it, hi, hungry, I'm dad, yeah, and she groans out loud every time already as a four-year-old, and what she doesn't know is we've only just begun. 18 more years of this kid, actually 14, she's out of the house at 18, right dads? All the dads with older kids are like, you just wait. You just wait. Well, today we are uh, in the last week of our series, What's on Tap? And next week we're starting a new series called Summer at the Gathering. It's something we do every year. And honestly, it's one of my favorite times. So let me tell you what Summer at the Gathering is. For the next seven weeks, um, we're going to have uh, messages that kind of come from the heart. And so uh, all of our messages come from the heart, but we plan our series out a year in advance so that we can be ready for what's coming, so we can prepare so our creative teams can get ready, all of those reasons. And it's with a lot of prayer and a lot of um, study that we build those a year in advance. But what happens is over the six months from the time we plan them until the summer, God speaks a lot of things into our hearts that we want to communicate. And summer at the gathering is our time to do that. And so uh, I'm so excited next week to celebrate the beginning of summer at the gathering. We're going to have a snow cone truck outside, so you don't want to miss it. Uh, we, we are excited to kick that off. I'll be teaching on worship next Sunday, and so be here. It's going to be a good one. Um, next Sunday as well is Growth Track Step 2. If you've never been to Growth Track, Growth Track takes place at 11 a.m. during our second service right outside these doors. If you can't find it, just go to our info center right here, and they'll walk you to the class. And step two is where we really start to kind of step into how God designed you. See, we believe every person 
was created with a purpose. It's what this series has been all about. And that every person was created with this God-given purpose. And what we want to do at the gathering is help you learn to know God, find freedom, discover that purpose so you can make a difference. And Growth Track is our way of leading you in the process of discovering your purpose. And so if you haven't gone through step one, it's okay. You can still come back and do step two next week. And that will be next Sunday at 11 a.m. So a lot of good stuff happening here. Uh, But today I want to wrap up our series by talking about, honestly, this is my favorite part of both processes, the fermentation process for the beer making and receiving the Spirit of God in our own lives as we develop our potential. In this series, we've been talking about the beer making process and studying potential. The brewer has the ability to look at four ingredients, the basic ingredients of beer, water, hops, barley, and yeast, and see the potential that they can bring out of it. There's so many different outcomes based on the development process. What we've learned is the process determines the outcome, that the process is so important to getting to the place we were designed and meant to be by our master brewer, the one who's made us and who placed that purpose inside of us. Through this process, we've talked about the milling of the grain, the mashing and laudering of the sweet wort, and this week, we're going to talk about the fermentation. Let me tell you what happens in the sciency part of things in fermentation real quick. The brewer at this point's really been with it with the beer. He's crushed it, shaped it, boiled it, all with the end in mind. Now that the work is done, it's time to wait. Once that wort has been cooled, they move it to a fermenter, which is just a big, large stainless steel vat. Next, yeast is added, and here is where the fun begins. The moment the yeast is added, it gets to work eating up the sugars that were created during the mash. As they consume the sugar, the yeast expels carbon dioxide and alcohol, as well as a variety of flavor compounds that vary greatly depending on the strain of yeast, the temperature of the fermentation, and a few other uh, things. Fermentation time varies from a few days for a simple ale to over a month for lagers. Here's what I think is really interesting about the fermentation process. Louis Pasteur discovered yeast in 1841. They've been making beer for a long, long time before that. What they thought before he discovered what yeast was, was special. In fact, all the way back in ancient ancient Mesopotamia, the word they used for the fermentation process was translated as God is good. Isn't that good? God is good. So basically, they made some kind of a gross tea, and they left it out for a while, and it turned into beer, and they were convinced that God had created this drink. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He has done good things. The yeast, the fermentation. You cannot have the beer without the fermentation process. It's interesting. Because we do all this work in the development. We do all this work in the design of it. But ultimately, the finished product is out of our hands. And the brewer does everything that he can in the process to control the outcome. But it is the yeast that changes the wort into beer. I would ask you this morning, have you been through the milling and the crushing and been changed? Have you had parts of you stripped away? Have you been in the development for years, working on an education, on apprenticeship, sharpening your skills, and chasing opportunities, only to find that on the other side of it, you still feel a little unsatisfied? Maybe you felt like you were meant for something in this life, but no matter what successes you find, you're still missing something. I would suggest there's one more step remaining for you. One more thing that is left to develop. One more important piece to reaching the potential that you were created with. Maybe you find yourself in one of two places. Maybe you should be happy, but you're not. Maybe you should feel fulfilled, but you don't. Maybe you had a goal for a long time, and then you got there, but it feels like it's missing something. 
Maybe, maybe it's in the context of, of your spiritual growth of the church. Maybe you, you got on the dream team. You, you thought you discovered your purpose. You went through this process, but it still feels like something's missing. Maybe it's a, in the realm of, of work. You, you've been working for a long time to get that qualification, to get that promotion, and you got the promotion, and yet somehow you still feel incomplete. Dads, maybe on the outside, it looks like you should be satisfied. You got the American dream, the house, wife, kids, two new cars, but something still feels missing. Maybe you've been developing yourself for a long time through school, through mentorship, learning from your hard seasons, but you can't help but feel like there's still more out there. Maybe you can relate to the words of King Solomon in Ecclesiastes 2.11, this king who had everything, riches, position, power, fame, all of it. And it says, yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Or maybe you're living your dream, but you still just feel like there's a little bit more. You're happy, you would say. Things are good. You, you've got a level of success in life. You can see that things have worked the way they should. And yet, you can't help but feel like there has to be more than this. Like there has to be something else that you're missing out on. Because now living the dream is starting to feel more and more just like being awake. And it's your normal life. And you're wondering where the significance is. Let's take a look back on the story of Joseph. Over the last two weeks, we've been looking at the early life of an ancient ruler. Joseph was born 4,000 years ago. And although life was very different back then, humanity wasn't. He, he, his experiences may seem so removed from the things we go through. And yet, Joseph had ambition like we have ambition. He experienced disappointment and pain the same way that we experience disappointment and pain. Joseph went through some of the same types of, of situations, feelings, moments that we have in our lives, even if the culture was far removed from our own. When we last left Joseph, he was sold into slavery to a man named Potiphar. Potiphar was the chief security officer for Pharaoh, a high-ranking official in the Egyptian government. Potiphar was. Joseph knew he was destined to be somebody great, destined to be a ruler. He had had dreams as a teenager where God had given him vision and, and shown him that he was going to put authority underneath him. He showed him that one day his brothers would bow before him, that he would become a great leader. He could see it. And yet, for the last 11 years, Joseph had served as the slave of an important person with a lot of power, a lot of position. He, he, had, he had the ability to manage and to lead, and yet every success that he had went to the name of somebody else. Every rich that he earned, every, every amount of riches, every, every dollar that he brought into the household landed in somebody else's bank account. Joseph, for years, worked faithfully and served well and gave everything that he had to the glory of somebody else. And after 11 years of that, Joseph was almost ready. He had what he needed, and much of what he didn't need anymore was gone. He would think that, that he was about there, but then things went a little bit sideways, Maybe you've been in this season of your life where you, you think, you know what, I've put, I put in the time. I've been faithful. I've been humble. I've been hungry. I've been working. I've been, I've been moving forward. I've been checking off the boxes. I've been doing what they say I should do. I've, got, I've even got three months of savings in the account. I'm debt free. I'm living well. I got a nice house. My kids are in a good school. Me and my wife, we seem to be doing well and things seem like they're going good. It must be time for me to finally start to feel satisfied. It must be my time to start to really see the dreams that God's put in my heart come into reality. But then things take a left turn or it just comes to a stop. It stalls. Suddenly you're not moving at the same speed you were moving before. 
Joseph, for 11 years, served faithfully in the home of Potiphar and was on his way to receiving some real dream fulfillment until, after 11 years, he was thrown in prison for being wrongfully accused of trying to rape Potiphar's wife. 11 years of faithful service. It says in God's word that the Lord was with Joseph and that he had favor upon him. And I just wonder if he was thinking that day as he was hearing the accusations, as, as they were giving him his sentence, if he still felt like the Lord was with him. If he could still feel the favor of God upon him. Or if he was beginning to wonder if any of it ever mattered in the first place. Let's take a look at Joseph's story this morning and let's see what we can learn from it. The first thing that I think is important for us to learn in this part of the process is that a waiting season isn't a wasted season. A waiting season is not a wasted season. I need you to hear me say it this morning if this is where you are. If you're in this place where everything seemed like it should be, you should be reaching breakthrough and instead you're reaching a stop. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep moving forward. Keep leaning into it. A waiting season is in a wasted season. Let's look at what Joseph does with this time of his life. Genesis chapter 30, verses 20 through 23. 39, excuse me. It says, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in the prison, the Lord was with him, and he showed him kindness And granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. And the warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care. Because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. Twice. I think the language is important. Twice here it says the Lord was with Joseph. Two times See, I think it's important for us to remember that even in the seasons where it feels like we've come to a hard stop, that God is still there, that he never stops, that even though it feels like we've stopped, you need to know that he doesn't stop. You see, this was one of those times where a lot of us, we hit that hard stop and the reaction really is just to kind of sit back and mope and say, well, I tried. I, I, gave, I, gave it, I gave it my best effort, and things didn't work out the way that I had planned. So I guess this is it. Like, I guess this is me now. I think it's interesting because if there's anywhere where it should be okay to sit back and mope, you would think it's jail, right? I mean, isn't that what jail is for? Like, isn't it just a long time to kind of reflect on how you got there? And if you're like Joseph and you shouldn't be there in the first place, then it's a long time to kind of sit back and mope. That's not what Joseph does. Joseph says, this isn't going to be a moping season for me because God is with me and his favor is upon me. I'm anointed. I'm called. He's called me to lead. So if I'm going to lead in a palace, I'll lead in a palace. Or if I'm going to lead from a prison, I will lead from a prison. He gets authority in the jail cell. He continues to grow his character, to grow his ability to manage people, to grow his ability to lead. And I think he does something else during this time. I think he begins to grow in the spirit. See, I think God does a work in seasons like this that is unique. Because I think the way that we learn to pray in seasons like this are different than the way that we would pray in other seasons. When we feel successful, our prayers look different. When we feel like things are going the way we want them, they look different. When things take a left turn, we learn what real prayer looks like. I think there's a specific kind of prayer that is prayed from a dark prison cell. Whether it's a literal dark prison cell or the prison of your circumstances, there is something special to what the Spirit can do in those seasons. I believe Joseph leaned into the power of the Holy Spirit in those seasons. I know that is true because of the way the Holy Spirit grew the spiritual gifts inside of him in that season. I don't know where you are in your life right now, but if you find yourself in a waiting season... I would encourage you to decide in that season from the very beginning that you're not going to just sit back and mope. Don't waste this waiting season by just waiting for it to end. It might not if that is the case. 
take this time to lean into the Spirit, to continue to move forward, to look at your circumstances and say, how can I do what I'm called to do even here, even in this place, even if it doesn't look like what I dreamed it would look like, if it's not the things that I've always wanted it to be, what do I need to do right now to keep pursuing what God has called me to do? And in those seasons of pain, And in those seasons of stillness, and in those seasons where it feels like it's a hard stop, I would encourage you to pursue his spirit like you never, ever have before. Because I believe that when we are in those seasons, that's our fermentation process. That a change is taking place in us. It is now outside of our hands. We put the work in. We put the development in. We've done all, we've read every Jim Collins book on leadership. We've done it. We've done it. We've, We've listened to the podcasts. We've had the conversations. Now what? Now it's time to let the Spirit do what only the Spirit can do. The thing that I I love that Joseph does in this season is he learns to connect his purpose with the Spirit of God. Connect your purpose with the Spirit of God. Here's what I mean. Here's how I know that God was growing the Spirit inside of Joseph in this time. Joseph received a spiritual gift as a teenager of prophecy, of the ability to interpret dreams and see what God was speaking to the person through those dreams, specifically his dreams. He had these dreams of different objects bowing and understood the spirit inside of him whispered the meaning of those dreams to him. Now, we are a decade removed from that, more than a decade removed from that. This has been maybe 14 or 15 years later. And Joseph is beginning to receive this gift again. The spirit is growing in him and he's spending time in prayer and he's worshiping and these two guys hit the jail cell with him. And he's stuck in there with them and they're two guys who had worked for the Pharaoh, who had worked for the king and they're having these dreams and Joseph listens to the dreams and says, okay, this dream means that you're gonna be released and get restored to uh, the job you were in before and you're gonna die, You're, you're dead, you're done. Sorry about that. And the, and the first guy was really grateful, and the other guy said, this guy's a wacko. He doesn't. So the dreams come true. And the, and the guy who, who was going to die, supposed to die, he dies. And then the other guy goes back up into Pharaoh's court, and he forgets all about Joseph, which is sad, because how are you going to forget about Joseph, you know? It's like this guy, this, he, he gave you the hope you needed. He forgets about Joseph until a specific season when Pharaoh starts having this dream over and over again, the same dream. And he sees this, it's weird, things are happening, nobody understands it. He's got all the magicians, all the, he's got the, the tarot cards, they're coming in. Everybody's trying to interpret the dream for him. And nobody really knows what it is about, what it's, what it's supposed to be saying. And then that guy remembers, wait a minute, wait a minute. There is a guy that's down in the jail cell right now. This is what he does. He can interpret dreams. Now here's what I want you to see. Joseph was going to come up here and interpret this dream. It was about a famine that was going to last for seven years. Now, Joseph's purpose, what God put him on this earth to do was to lead. He was a leader. He was a a leader of people, a manager of people. God put his purpose inside of him when he was young. He said when he was a teenager, I see in you a leader. People are going to bow before you. You're going to bring people out of a hard season into a better season, out of a season of famine, into a season of prosperity. That's who I created you to be. And Joseph had a lot of that in him from the beginning. We see it throughout his story. He's able to manage well. He he understands how goods work. He was in Potiphar's household developing this for a long time. He was running Potiphar's affairs. And he learned how the whole thing worked to the point where the Bible says Potiphar didn't pay him any attention anymore. Joseph was leading so well. It was the same when he got in the prison cell. He was managing the people, leading the tasks, taking care of it so much so that the jailer didn't even have to think about it anymore. He was gifted. He was gifted in the natural of leadership, but it was something else that was going to get him out of this mess, that was going to give him the breakthrough that he was looking for. See, Joseph was learning how to connect his purpose with the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph comes up, and the Pharaoh describes his dream, and Joseph says, here's what your dream means. It means you're about to walk into seven years of famine, and then Joseph says, here's a plan that I've put together 
Here's a, here's a detailed plan that I've put together on what you should do next to get ready for it. Here's how we're going to prepare for this. You see what's happening? It's his natural gifts and his spiritual gifts connecting with one another. Look at Pharaoh's response. Genesis 41, 37. The plan seemed good to Pharaoh and to all of his officials. The plan was good. So Pharaoh asked him, can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the Spirit of God. He didn't ask him, can we find anybody like this? One who has the ability to develop a plan quite as well as this man. Can we find one in whom is, is in the Spirit of Collins? Is there somebody in this house right now that is as good of a manager as this man right here? It was the Spirit of God that stood out to Pharaoh above all else. Can we find anyone like this man? One in whom is the Spirit of of God. Then Pharaoh, so, jo, so well, I lost my place. Here we are. You shall be, verse 40, you shall be in charge of my palace, and all of my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. He says, since God has made all of this known to you, there's no one so discerning and wise as you. Joseph was stepping into his purpose. He reached his potential. He found the fulfillment of the dreams God placed in his heart. This is what I want us to learn from this part of the story. The Spirit of God is the yeast in our fermentation. It's the ingredient necessary to reach the potential of your purpose. Because I believe your purpose isn't for you. See, we can, we can get an eye on what we're made to do. We can look at our gifts and our passions, the dreams that were placed inside of us and say, I think this is what I was made to do and this is what I was called to do. And we can grow in it and we can learn about it and we can move towards it to a point. But there will always be a cap unless we allow God into that purpose. See, I believe that every single one of us was created to glorify God. And the, the gifts that he's given you, the passions he's placed inside of you, the dreams that he's put in your heart, all of those things are to accomplish the glory of God. Here's what I mean. Your purpose was placed inside of you by the creator of the universe, the God of creation. And you cannot reach the fullness of that purpose without the one who put it there. He changes us from the inside out. Joseph had all this experience and character to back him up. And that was important and it impressed Pharaoh. But the thing that stuck out the most to Pharaoh was the spirit of God inside of him. See, I believe the final piece to reaching our potential is our relationship with Jesus. Maybe you're in here today and you don't follow Jesus. You're here because you love the people here. You're here because you have questions. You're here because church has kind of always been a part of your life. And you would say that you believe something, you don't know if you believe everything. Well, you're in the right place. The gathering is a place you can belong before you believe. But since you're here, it tells me you're willing to listen to this, so I've got to tell this to you right now. Listen. The God of the universe who created the heavens and the earth and the mountains and the animals and all of the sea creatures, all of it, he created you too, and out of all of creation, you are his favorite. You are the only one that he puts his image on, that he puts a purpose in. And inside of you, he places this purpose that is so big that you can't even begin to imagine it yet. He puts amazing potential on our lives. But with him, only with him, with his spirit inside of us, can we reach the fullness of that potential because it is a potential he created. So it only makes sense that the creator of our potential would be a part of that potential. In the New Testament passage in Ephesians, it says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory. When his power is at work within us, we can do immeasurably more in our lives. But it's according to his power, and it's for his glory. Every one of us is born with natural gifts. Some of us can sing or play guitar. 
Some of us are athletes. Some of us are mathletes, you know. Some can act well, speak well. Some can create art. Some are gifted leaders, gifted managers of people. Some of us have the gift of vision. Some of us have the gift of executing that vision. It's rarely the same person, isn't it? But when you enter into a relationship with Jesus and the Spirit of God is in you, your natural gifts are complemented by spiritual gifts gifts and they complement one another and they go together and your potential is realized when the natural meets the spiritual and they are both being developed and that is your purpose and it's your ultimate reason for existence. You cannot reach your full potential without the spirit of God because your purpose is to glorify God. If your accomplishments only serve to glorify you, you will always be missing something you will be lacking. We say it this way. The Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me does not make me better than you. It makes me better than me. You got to understand this morning that we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. What I believe and what the Bible says is that inside of us when we enter into a relationship with Jesus is the same power that brought Jesus Christ back from the dead. And we can go into our lives and try to serve our purpose without the power of the Holy Spirit, but that would be like going into a boxing match with our hands tied behind our backs. No matter how strong you think that headbutt is, it's not going to be as effective as you think it will be. The power of the Holy Spirit is the key to unlocking the potential he made inside of you. It is your natural gifts alongside your spiritual gifts that walk you into your purpose. It would not have been enough for Joseph to rule all of Egypt, for everyone to know his name, for everyone to bow before him, for all the riches in all of the world to be at his feet would not have been enough without God's spirit inside of him. And you know I'm right because even outside of Christianity, we talk about this. There's this great lie that, that inside and outside of Christianity, we believe that, that it would be status and financial security and position and power and a person that would lead us to the ultimate satisfaction we're all looking for. And yet we've got all these songs written and all these movies made that are all about how we won't find fulfillment in these things. You know, I think it's interesting in Hollywood, almost every movie that you see, unless it's a movie with bad acting, has no Christian characters. Unless they're a weirdo. There's no Christian characters that on television, save for touched by an angel, right? There's no Christian characters in movies. And yet, so many of their plot lines revolve around somebody pursuing position, pursuing security, pursuing leadership, position, authority, all of it, pursuing relationship only to feel empty at the end. And the solution that they usually wrap it up in in Hollywood is that there was a person that they were looking for that was really the fulfillment, but most of us know how that story ends as well. Because if you rely on a person to give you your hope and your satisfaction and everything you need in life, you're putting too much pressure on that relationship and it will crack at some point. You see, all of these stories that our culture tells are just crying out the same thing that God has been whispering to creation since the Garden of Eden. We were made to be together. We were made to be united. We will find our peace, our satisfaction, and our strength in him alone. Since he created you, when you're glorifying him the way he created you too, you will find ultimate satisfaction and joy because that's how he created you. That's your purpose. Let me say this for dads on Father's Day. I think a lot of us are either chasing after a good father or chasing after a lot, a lack of a father as dads, especially my generation the dads that are my age, maybe you had a dad who was great and who set the bar high and, and now you have this pressure to try and raise your kids that way or, or do the things that he did. Or maybe, maybe like so, so many, you're a part of this fatherless generation. And either you had a dad who didn't know how to be present for you, how to 
express his, his love to you, for you. He was never with you, or maybe you didn't have a dad. And either way, you're stepping into fatherhood with no baseline. You don't know what to reach for. You don't know, you don't know how, to, how, to, how, to, how to know whether or not it's going well. You're doing the right things. And, and maybe you've done everything. You've tried hard. You've been there. You've been present. You don't miss games. Maybe you made a, a pledge. I'm never going to miss a game. My dad was never at a single one. I'm never going to miss one. Not for my kids. Or I'm going to make sure that my kids know that I see them. I'm going to look, I'm going to make sure I make eye contact with them every single day. Maybe you've done all this and you still feel like you're lacking. Like something's missing. Like, like there's, there's more. See, I think that this journey that we go on where we're just searching to get there is reflected in just every level of life, fatherhood included. Dads, let me encourage you that the piece that you are missing, if you feel like it's missing, is the spirit of God. Invite him into the process. You can get a whole lot wrong as a father, but if you, can, if you are present and you teach them the power of the Holy Spirit, and if you, if, you know what, if you say and do the wrong things half the time, but you invite the Spirit of God into the fathering process, you're gonna get it right. You're gonna get it right. I've started something, I, this is bad, I'm a pastor, and uh, some of you guys are years ahead of me on this, but like a couple months ago, I started, uh, I always have prayed for my kids, and I started praying for, I've got two daughters, and I started praying for their husbands and the men that they would be and the way that God would use them and, and the fathers that they would become. And I'm just telling you, Dad, you just got to let the Holy Spirit be a part of the journey. And it will make everything go differently for you and for your kids. All right, it, it, the fermentation season, here's the key. Last thing, then we're done. I know dads have got to get some fishing done today, so I'm going to try to get you out of here early. Pursue closeness with God. This is it. Here's how you get through it. You hit the wall, you're in the waiting season. Pursue closeness with God. Maybe you've been coming for a while and you're noticing that like, that's like the last point of every sermon here lately. That's why I'm gonna teach a whole message on it next week. Here's what I want you to know. I believe nothing will have a greater impact on your life than your closeness with God. I believe nothing in, in all of creation will lead to a greater satisfied heart for you than your closeness with God. I believe that nothing in your life will lead to you being a better parent than your closeness with God. I believe nothing in your life will lead to you being a greater leader than your closeness with God. It's the most important thing. You're made to worship. That's what we're here for. We're here to glorify God, our purpose this thing that he put inside of us, this drive that we have to be successful, to find success, to, to reach our potential. That drive exists as a form of worship. It's to glorify him. And so in these seasons when we're getting closer to it and we want to firm it, we want to grow, we want his spirit to change us and transform us, it is not any kind of wishing that gets us there. It's not going to church and sitting in here and listening to me talk. It's your pursuit of your closeness with God that leads to the outcome you've been chasing. Get after him. A couple different ways to do it. You need to hear him. You need to hear his voice. You need to know who he is. Understand his character. You need to study his word. Get, get, in, get in the Bible. Just read the word. Get in it. Make it a commitment. I promise you, it, it, it will become fresh before your eyes the more time you spend in it. I'm a pastor. This is my job. I have to read the Bible a lot. Have to. Get to. I'm, I'm right now, I'm reading it straight through for the seventh time. And I'm always amazed. I've read the same passages over and over. I'm amazed at the freshness of it. That I just open it up to a story that I thought I knew. And God says, you, you have not even yet begun to understand my goodness, my compassion, my mercy, my grace. You just got to study his word. You got to get to understand who he is. I believe the more we get into his word, the more clear his heart will become to us and the greater it will give you clarity over your future. Just make it a priority. Spend time in it. Here's the big one. I don't think anything that you do 
will affect the growth of the power of the Spirit in your life more than worship and prayer. Worship and prayer. Worship and prayer. We're made to worship. The Bible says that God is He's searching for true worshipers. That he draws close to us when we worship him in spirit and in truth. That it's, he's attracted to it. He, can, he can't help himself. You start to worship, he's just in. And if you want to get to the place that you were made to be, to serve in the purpose you were given, and you want to feel, you, you, you want to feel the satisfaction of this life, the joy that you can have here in this life, the blessing that his word promises over and over and over again, it just starts in worship and in prayer. It just, if I've got the time, I'll just, I'll worship as long as I can. And, but I got to make sure, I don't always, you know, you got little kids, there's not always a lot of time. But I don't like to start my day without at least just one. My favorite song right now is What a Beautiful Name It Is, you know, and I can't, I don't want to start a day without it. I need to be reminded. I need a, I need a moment to remember that, that he is powerful and, his, and he is good, that he's got no rival, that nothing comes close to his goodness, that no matter what happens for the rest of this day, that I'm going to start this morning by doing what I was put on this earth to do. I'm going to worship him. And then I'll spend some time in prayer. Maybe you haven't been in prayer in a while. and Maybe you committed to it in 21 days of prayer at the beginning of the year, and it's kind of tapered off. Summer rhythm's hitting. We, we've got 21 days of prayer coming up again in August, but you don't have to wait. You can start today. And maybe when, when you get back into it, sometimes it feels a little bit awkward and a little uncomfortable. You don't really know what to say. If you're in a relationship with somebody, you ever been in a relationship with somebody and they travel, they, they, they go away for work for a little while, or maybe they take a vacation without you? What's up with that? Come on, bring me on that vacation. I just did that to my wife. Sorry, honey. And you go away for a little while, and you come back together, and there's this tension. You know what I mean? There's this tension. My, I, I'm going to be honest with you about my marriage. Rail and I are usually mad at each other after we spend a little time apart. We're mad at each other because we've missed each other so much. Does this make sense? Anybody else? Am I alone in this? You missed each other so much, and now you're just mad about it. You know, and so you're kind of grumpy the first day back together, and you sit down, and so much has happened in the last few days. You don't know how to talk about it, so you don't really talk, and it's a week before things are normal again. And if it's like that with the person that you're in the room with, why wouldn't it be like that with God? Prayer can be that way. If you haven't prayed in a while, it can be awkward to get into it, feel uncomfortable. There could be tension. But you just got to do the same thing that I would do with my wife, and that is just keep, keep talking, keep asking. Just sit there in the presence for a moment. Let that spirit grow inside of you. You got to go before and worship, and you got to just talk to him. I always start by praising him. Just, God, you are so good. I thank you so much for the way that you're blessing me. I like to list out the blessings, the things that I'm most grateful for that day. I think that sets your mind right, God. Thank you for this and that. Pray over my kids, my wife. Pray over, pray over people in my life that need prayer, people that have asked for prayer. And I just think the more we worship and pray, the more power of the Spirit fills us up. Worship and prayer. Get around people who are following Jesus. If you're not in a life group, we're a couple weeks into our summer life groups. It's not too late. Get in one. Get in one. Be, in a, be around people who are following Jesus. Just get around the table with them. You know, the same power, the same spirit that is in you is in them. And when you get together, it grows. The power is felt. The spirit's presence is palpable. It's the same spirit. And even if you're just sitting around the table eating, I'm just telling you, you will benefit from it. You'll grow from it. Get around other people following Jesus. Worship more, pray more. And I wonder what would happen if we would trust this process. Will we, will we learn, will we find more to learn from in the milling, in the crushing? Will we find more satisfaction in the development? Will we grow more, will we work harder? Would we embrace the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives during the waiting season? Will we keep growing even when we live in our potential? This is my hope for you this morning. I believe there can be more for us in these times. If it feels like you're at an all stop, maybe God is saying, get to know me a little bit first. Get to know who I am 
and I'll get it set up for you on the other side. My prayer for us this morning is as we seek out the purpose of our potential, as we move towards it, that we would pursue him above all else and that he would be glorified in the process. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for who you are, for the way that you've created us to worship you, to glorify you, God. I thank you for the gifts you put inside of us, for the talents, God, for the purpose you've called us to. Lord, for every person in this room today who's not yet discovered their purpose, who is, who is still wondering why, what, what are they here for, what, what does it all mean that you would open their eyes? That, God, you would give them breakthrough and revelation. That, Father, you would put in front of them a path to take. God, for every person in this room who has discovered their purpose but who is still waiting, that, Father, you'd give them the energy to get up and keep moving forward, to keep their heads up, to pursue your spirit in a fresh way, God, to pursue you in a new way, God, to come into your presence daily, Father, to bring you the kind of worship that grows the power of your spirit inside of us. We just give you all of our praise, God. We lay our dreams at your feet, Lord. We lay our potential at your feet, God. It is yours. Be glorified in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.